Okay, today we're going to talk about financial investments. Our previous lecture, we had a brief exposure to the theory of finance, transferring the resources through time. We talked about financial management, the financial function, and the tools of financial management, and just a little bit on the financial characteristics of agriculture. Today we're going to have an introduction to financial investments. We're going to do a broad overview of what we mean by financial investments, the participants in the financial markets. We'll talk about <coughs> investing in stock, investing in debt, the use of futures and options, and of course uh, we'll end up with a statement about risk and return. I want to start, before we get too far into this, to let you know this one lecture is not a substitute for a course in the in the business school on investments. This is just hopefully to whet your appetite or at least give you a working understanding of some of the vocabulary that you will be exposed to as you look at financial investment. We will start using the financial calculators. It's important that you have them when we are talking about the use of them because I'll give you examples again on the financial calculators. If your budget's short, you can, you'd probably pick up a Casio or a TI for less than $20, maybe even less if you, if you shop or search. Uh, or you can go out and buy the more expensive in the $100 ranges of the HP or the TI. And some of your calculators that you already have, if you read the manual or look at, may have a button that allows you to pull up the financial uh, buttons. Technically, what you're going to need is the five buttons. You don't need a, the sophisticated tax account and calculators. You just need the payment, the interest rate, the present value, the payment, and the future value. And if I said payment at the beginning, I meant the number of years. So you have the N, I, P, V, payment, and the F, V, future value. You just need those five functions, and we can make it work. For another reading, the War Financier Air Request Amends, that is a handout. I do want you to read that. Let's talk about financial uh, investments. Think about in, in this concept. You just got paid. You have $1,000. What are you going to do with it? One of the things that you can do with that money is to invest in real goods. The real goods are something that I like to think of uh, as things that you can touch. That's why below I have a tractor, a car. Those are real goods. Pencils, paper, are the real goods or you can invest in financial goods if, uh, if you put your money in the savings account does that mean you bought the bank no but you have your money there you've invested in it and, and hopefully you get some interest back the same with stocks and bonds you're, you're not buying actually a physical good you're buying a security you know a paper a claim <coughs> on something so you can use your money to actually go out and buy land or a tractor or you can go in and and uh, buy a certificate of deposit or a stock certificate or a bond or at uh, your stage it's most likely when you get paid you're going to consume it pay your rent buy clothes pay tuition food so those are your basic things that you can use your money and obviously we can break those to very a lot of detail but these are the three uh, broad categories that we can use to spend our money now I want to introduce the term securities because if you listen to the radio or read the newspaper or watch TV at night, you're, you're going to hear this word security. What's happening to the security market? Are you going to invest in the security market? And actually a security is just a piece of paper that gives you title to something. A security can be if it gives you a title to an underlying real asset such as common stock. A common stock it doesn't actually say that you bought that factory or, or that car or you have title specifically to that factory or car or truck or whatever, but it gives you claim to all the underlying assets as a whole. You are an owner. A security can give you title to a strictly financial claim, such as a treasury bond. And if you buy the, a treasury bond, you basically are buying the rights to, to receive those coupon payments or those interest payments over a specified period of time and at the end of that period of time receive a bigger payment of its uh, par value. In that case you have claim to an income stream but you don't have claim to the assets. And that's the big difference between the stock market and the bond market is if you own stock you are an owner. 
and you have claim to the assets. Whereas if you own a bond and you have a strictly financial claim, you only have right to an income stream, but you don't have rights to the assets. And what are the goals that you have if you decide to invest your money in a financial investment? Okay, it's pretty obvious. Uh, one, you want to make money. And if you like to make money, it's probably fair to say that you really want to make a lot more money. You want to make as much money as you can. But if we push that to the extreme, you're also going to temper that by saying, well, I also want to avoid risk. You know, and obvious, if I set up an investment or a game here, and I said with the flip of a coin, if the uh, coin is heads, I'll give you $5 million. If it comes up tails, you get nothing. And if I told every one of you, you can play this game for a dollar, I bet every one of you would play, unless there's uh, moral reasons for not doing it. From an investment standpoint, it'd be a no-brainer. But if I ask each of you to ante up $1 million to play the game, how many would you play? I could say four million. Would you play for four million? And the answer is probably not. In other words, even though there was a, a nice high payoff of winning, you would play the game because you want money and you want more money, but there's a point where the risk is too high. I mean, it's, you can't just look at, boy, that's a very profitable investment. Well, I can make 300% return on the Belgian bonds right now. And somebody tells you, well, they don't pay off very often. Looking at the financial investments, there's some keys to investment that you can consider. There's some truisms here that are, that are important. And one is, is if you're looking to invest in something that has a high return, there's going to be high risk associated with it. So the first time somebody offers you this great investment, you're going to make so much money if you get into this, you need to stop and say, okay, where's, what's the probability of the payoffs? because there's going to be some high risk associated. There's no free lunch. There's a price for bearing risk. There's no expected high return without uh, bearing some high risk associated with it. The, the markets out there that are efficient, and I'll talk about that word in a minute, you're going to have an arbitrage out there so that this is something that you're always going to face. That means then when you're looking at measuring how well you have done, or you're trying to measure how well somebody else has done in their investments, you have to be careful because you have to measure it in light of the risks that they have taken. Uh, I grew up with potato farmers out in the great northwest. They knocked down the sand dunes and brought in the irrigation, pumped it with nitrogen, and had these beautiful potatoes. But it seemed almost uncanny that on, on every four years, on election year, they seemed to have a bumper profits, good crops, high prices. So about once in every four years, all those potato farmers were very wealthy. But what happened to the next three years? They would lose it. And so my point is, you couldn't just look at those potato farmers and say, look, boy, look at all the money they make. They, they have high profits without also looking at the fact that that was a very risky crop to produce. And those that on the average did, did, did better over the long run were those that had the potatoes as, along with other crops that they could manage in the, in the off years. Okay, let's look at the participants in the financial market. The first is the individuals. Okay, we're talking about securities. And that security, like a stock or a bond, you buy it. You're paying somebody else the money for that piece of paper that then gives you a claim on those assets or claim on that income stream. So as an individual, as a whole, we in, uh, the individuals invest, right? They're the ones that buy the stocks and the bonds. So they demand those securities. They're the ones that demand that because they're buying the stocks and the bonds. And in return, they're giving what? Cash, right? You're paying cash to buy that security. Now, if you think about it, when I say net, that's important to understand because when you put your money or when you borrow money, to buy your car, you know, let's say a house. When you buy a house, in that particular case, do you demand the security or do you supply the security? <coughs> what are you getting from the bank? When you take out a mortgage, what is the bank giving you? They're giving you money to buy it. And what are you giving the bank? The collateral or a security? And what is that security called? Called the mortgage or the promissory note. Basically, you're giving them a promissory note and then from that promissory note, that then you have an obligation to pay the bank. In that particular case, you are a supplier. 
an individual is a supplier of securities. But as a whole, as a net, as a group of total individuals as a whole, they are net demanders of those securities, of the stocks and bonds. Now, if we look at the government, you think they're a net supplier or a net demander? What does your congressman always want to do? Raise taxes? Why does he want to raise taxes? What does your congressman want? Be reelected. And what do they need to get reelected? Money. And where are they going to get that money? Taxes is one, but they also do what? What do they issue? Treasury bonds. So they take these treasury bonds and they sell them. So they are supplying a security, right? In return, they get cash. And what do they do with that cash? They go out and buy votes. You should be concerned about this because uh, right now the U.S. government has a lot of debt because they've issued a lot of treasury bonds, right? Who's going to pay that back? You're going to pay it back plus interest. For the most part, who are the holders of those treasury bonds? Individuals. So it's coming back to the, to the people, right? So government as a whole supply securities as a net. Okay, the institutional investor is someone like a mutual fund. They get their money from individuals who then ask the institutional investor or the mutual fund to invest that money in stocks and securities so they become net demanders, just like the individuals. They're basically a proxy for the individual. Uh, the institutional investor <laughs> basically collects the cash from a whole host of individuals who then uh, invest in the stocks and the bonds. And that's where you get the, as I said, the mutual funds. That's what they're created. They, they are net demanders of securities. If you look at businesses, you think they demand the security or supply the security. If you're starting a business, what do you want? Capital. And how are you going to get that capital? You can go out and issue stock or you can issue bonds or, or some kind of a promissory notes. For what purpose? And so they can purchase the assets that they need to run that business. So the businesses themselves then can be considered net suppliers. Now they also can buy in their portfolio, they can buy uh, treasury bonds and stocks from other companies. So they will demand securities, but as a net, as a whole, they're going to be suppliers. Looking at bonds, you have people, individuals that are demanding the bonds and government and uh, businesses that uh, supply. What sets the interest rate? It's where the supply and the demand are equal. And so if you have businesses that are in an expansion mode and they need to borrow more money and so they, you're going to have a, a situation where you're going to have the interest rates go higher. The basics, the supply and demand out there in the interest rates is the same as different markets but the same con concept as you're going to get with corn. The price of corn is established by the supply and demand of that product and it's the same out there in the bond market. Okay, overview of investments, some basics of investment, uh, looking at the time value of money. We're going to focus on the time value of money so that we can basically recognize that a dollar today is not the same as a dollar a year from now or 10 years from now, and that has to be accounted for when you're doing an investment decisions. And the other we've already mentioned is that we also have to develop measures of risk and return so that we're not uh, looking and uh, just saying, well, they had a 15% return. They also has to look at the risk and the volatility and the variation of that return, and we have to figure out measures to calculate that. Let's talk about uh, now investing in stocks, some general information. We have a primary market and investment banking to facilitate that primary market. Let's take something that's close to home here, looking at Google. Google was a private set up by some individuals and they become very big and at some point they decided to go public. They wanted to issue more stock so that they'd have more capital to invest. So when they went out and did that initial price offering or sold it for the first time, when Google went out on the market for the first time, and if any of you were so fortunate to buy into that initial price offering, you probably made some money. But that is done through what's called the investment banker, the Merrill Lynch's of the world, the Edwards, Golden Sachs. Those investment bankers are the ones that analyze the market, and they're the ones that offer those uh, stocks at a particular price. If they do their job, and they do it well, and you buy into that, there's not going to be a, a large variation of that price after that initial price offering. 
Now, if you bought stock in Google in anticipation that the price was going to go up, and let's say it did, and now you want to take that money out and invest in another good investment, who are you going to sell it to? Well, you can go door to door, or you can sell it in what we call the secondary market. That's where you have the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, and there's a number of other stock exchanges that basically bring buyers and sellers together. All you have to do is go to a stockbroker like Merrill Lynch and say, look, I've got a thousand shares in uh, Google and I want to sell 500 shares. How much will they sell for? And they'll give you, oh, they'll probably sell for $36 a share. And then you tell them, okay, I want to sell 500 shares at uh, 37. And so they'll send it out and, and when the market gets to that price, it'll be executed. That's what happens in the secondary market. The other thing to be aware of, and in stocks, it's heavily regulated, and there's a lot of tax issues involved that you need to be concerned about. How much you, are you taxed on gains from your stocks? And it's certainly uh, regulated. There's such things as there's no inside trading. If you're trading on inside information, it's against the law, and you can go to jail. Who's the lady that did some time, Martha Stewart. She went to jail because it was said she traded on inside information. I visited the New York Stock Exchange and there was a room about half the size of this room where they had computers. And they had people that were watching all the trades. If they identified an individual that was consistently making what seemed to be a, an unreasonable amount of money from the stocks, they investigated. And they didn't just go look at that person and say, oh, that person, well, he's, he's a professor at A&M. He has no inside information. No. They look at uh, relatives or acquaintances. And if they find they have a, an uncle that works for Merrill Lynch that has inside information and that's being funneled to the professor at A&M, they will prosecute. Okay, some of the basic principles. To understand in the stock market, you have to understand that if you buy stock in General Motors, you are an owner, which means that you're in the residual position. That means if General Motors make lots of money, that's going to be reflected to you as returns, either as dividends or your price is going, the price of your shares is going to go up. On the other hand, as a residual owner, if General Motors loses lots of money, then that's going to be reflected in your dividends, not getting any dividends, or your stock price is going to go down. Either way, you're going to lose money. You're always on the tail end. Now to bring that even closer to home, let's use an example that's, that some of you may be somewhat familiar with, and that's Enron. That may have happened before you were watching the market, but Enron was an aggressive energy trading company that was seemingly making lots of money, and the stock price was going up nicely, and people were investing in it, and even the, even the employees of Enron, uh, some of them had a lot of stock in their retirement in Enron. Something happened. They discovered that they were doing illegal trade. And when the market found out that they were making their money illegally, guess what happened to the price of Enron? Everybody then who had stock in Enron, who were the, in a residual position, they got pennies on the dollar of the money that they invested in that. The creditors, the people that had purchased bonds in the bank, they were paid off before the people that owned stock. The people that had the creditors of Enron were not as in bad a position as the stockholders. The stockholders were the, in, the, in the last position to have claim on those assets. The bank and the bondholders have the first claim on the assets or income of that company. And that's something that you need to recognize. If you get into the stock market, you have a greater chance historically of making money in the stock market than you have in the bond market. But because you have a greater expected return in the stock market, you also have a greater risk. So when you're young, you know, and you can take those risks, it's good to be in the stock market. But as you get older and closer to retirement, then you have to be careful that you have a greater proportion of more secure uh, assets. If you're looking at stocks, uh, you have security analysts, people that are looking at stocks, prices, trying to determine if they're going up or down. You have the two types. You have technical and fundamental. And if you've had marketing classes, you're, you've already studied this to death. 
but very briefly, a technical analyst is someone that's looking at the kind of the human movements of the market. They're looking at charts. They're looking at whether the charts are going up or down. What's the 12 month moving average and the three year moving average? And, you know, is there peaks and valleys? Uh, those are uh, very important for those that are doing day trading or the scalpers that are looking at that market minute by minute trying to figure out uh, how to make money. Whereas somebody in the fundamentals is looking at the basic supply and demand or the, or the factors affecting the supply and demand associated with a particular industry. It, they have more of a long-term uh, view of it and, and that's where an economist is going to come in and trying to predict is, is the price of, uh, of the automo automobile industry going up or is it headed down or is it stable based on all the factors that, that go into that. The other concept in stocks is the efficient markets. <coughs> in this particular case, if markets are efficient, prices have adjusted for all information and there are no sure bargain. What we're saying is if the market is efficient at this minute, at this moment, where all the players in the uh, stock market are in play, they have established the price of all the stocks. And at that minute, a person doesn't know whether the price is going to go down or up. There's just as great a chance of it going down as there is up because the market's efficient. But a minute later, the prices will change because more in information is available. The Tyson chicken example. Right at this minute, the Tyson's chicken is selling at $60 a share. But when that newspaper article comes out, or, or when it hits the news right a minute later that Tyson has an outbreak of salmonella in their factories, what happens to the price? A minute ago, you didn't know that, right? If you did, you could have had a sure bargain by selling short the, the market but you don't have that information. There are no sure bargains then in an efficient market. Okay. There's different of opinions. There's people that think it's going up and some people think it down and then uh, and the price then is established based on those everybody's opinion. But all that information is, is assimilated at that minute. Each minute there's more information that comes available thus you see uh, prices fluctuating the same way you see corn prices or, or cattle prices fluctuating. If you look at investing in stock, uh, you want to manage the risk associated with it, and we do that through portfolio diversification. <coughs> and uh, the way to diversify is you don't put all your money into Enron. If you followed that, and it was a few years ago, you may not have, but there was a lot of anguish by a lot of people because their whole life savings and security and retirement went down the tubes because they were not what? Diversified. It looked great because, the, because that company looked like it was going to continue to go up forever as long as they could see, but just like that, it crashed. And because they weren't diversified, some people lost all of their savings. That in it alone should explain why you want to diversify. That's why you want some in Enron and some in General Motors and some in Google. But more than that, you want to have stocks with different characteristics so that if you have one company going down, you have another that might be going up. You don't want to, for example, you don't want to say, I'm diversified, I have money in Ford, <coughs> Chrysler, Toyota, Nissan. Uh, granted, those all do different and better at different periods of time. They do fluctuate, but as a whole, the car industry is going together based on some of the same fundamentals. So you don't want to diversify in the same type of stock. You want to have stock that have different market characteristics. So maybe instead of just car, maybe you should also buy into a steel industry. Knowing that as steel prices go up, that's going to have a bad impact on cars. You basically want to uh, buy in stocks that are negatively correlated so that if prices one up, the other is going down, vice versa. So it's not just there's a diversification. You need to, to have in your mix as best you can uh, stocks that are not highly correlated with each other. But looking at investing in debt, what obviously is the bond market and basically it's a promise of fixed periodic payments. You buy the bond, pay for the money, and in return the issuer of that bond then pays the person that holds the bond a fixed payment uh, through its maturity. Some definitions that you should know. If you look at the bond market, it trades debt securities with maturities over one year. They're, they have longer maturities. whereas you have an opportunity maybe to invest in the money market 
and that trades debt securities with maturities less than one year. <coughs> Some of you uh, that have a savings account in your bank uh, have the opportunities to put your money into money market accounts and you, you differentiate that between a bond market by the length of their maturities. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, futures uh, and options. This is a, a repeat for, for some of you. A futures contract is a contract for the sale of a good at some point in the future at a specified price. Let's view this in the context of a farmer rancher, how they might use the futures contract as, as is fit into this definition and then maybe look at it from, a, from an investor side as well. Let's say that you're uh, running a uh, feed yard operation and that you bring in feeder cattle and you finish them out for five, year, uh, five months and then you sell them as the fat cattle. Let's say that uh, right now the uh, fat cattle are selling for $60 a hundredweight. Now if you stay in the cash market and you figure that you can make money at $60 a hundredweight by finishing the feeder cattle out for five months. Let's say in five months a price of a fat cattle goes from 60 to 65 dollars a hundredweight. Are you happy? Now if you could make money at 60 dollars a hundredweight, you get an extra five dollars a hundredweight on that lot of cattle, you're pretty happy, aren't you? And in fact, everybody slaps you on the back about how good of an investor you are, how, how smart you are at, uh, in your business. But what happens because of some downturns in the market, uh, price goes to 55 dollars a hundredweight. Now what? If you're making a good return at $60, now you're only getting 55, now what's happened? You've lost a lot of money. Now you're not looking so good, are you? You pencil it out and you uh, talk to your, your Merrill Lynch advisor and they say, look, you can lock in the fat cattle prices in five months for, 50, for $60 a hundredweight. So you're basically, based on this rule, we, we have a contract now for the sale of a good at some point five months in the future at a spe specified price, the $60 a hundredweight. We now purchase this uh, futures contract. So we buy the futures contract and we have a specified price of $60 a hundredweight in five months. Now, what happens if the uh, price of the fat cattle in the, at the end of five months, when you get ready to sell, what happens when the fat cattle price goes to $55 a hundredweight? How much do you sell your fat cattle for? If the price is 55, you sell them for 55, right? So you've lost basically $5 a hundredweight. But what's happened to your futures contract? If you have somebody that's agreed on the other end to, to buy your cattle at $60 a hundredweight and the price is now at 55, you can sell it for 60 and you can buy it for 55, how much have you gained on that futures contract? $5. So you've lost $5 on your fat cattle, but how much have you gained on your futures contract? You lost five, you gained five, so you net zero, so you sell it for 60, right? So your net is 60. And that's what you agreed to that five months previously is you wanted to lock in your price at $60 a hundredweight. Let's switch the scenario. What happens if the uh, price of fat cattle goes to $65 a hundredweight? in five months. In that case, pretty happy. He goes out and he sells his cattle for $65 a hundredweight. But what happened to his futures contract? He agreed to sell at 60. Now he has to go out and buy at 65. So what is his loss? Five dollars. So he made $65 for selling in the cash market, but he lost five dollars in the futures market. So what's his net? 60. Now he goes to the coffee shop and what do all his neighbors do? You stupid fool. We told you the futures market were risky. In fact, because of that scenario, a lot of farmers don't like the futures market because they don't realize that when you hedge, you're locking in the price. Now remember, there's the flip side of that. In the second scenario, the farmer lost $5. Who earned the $5? The speculator, right? The investor. Or conversely, in the first case, where the farmer made the $5, there was an investor who uh, sold them that futures contract that lost it. Now let's go back and look at this scenario where the prices went up and the farmer didn't get to take advantage of that increase in the, in the fat cattle prices. Wouldn't it be nice if you uh, could buy a contract like the futures contract that protected you if the prices went down but allowed you to but not hurt you if the prices went up? 
You know, if the prices go down to 55, you'd make $5 in the uh, futures market. But if the uh, prices went to 65, you wouldn't know anything in the futures market. You could take advantage of the $5 increase. Wouldn't that be nice? That's what we call the options contract. The options contract is a contingent claim. It gives the, the holder the right to buy or sell something at a particular price during a specified period of time. In other words, this gives the right to the borrower to sell those cows at $60 a hundredweight, but not the obligation. So if the prices drop to 55, he can then exercise that contract and earn the money. But if it goes to 65 or 70 or 80, there is no obligation to exercise that contract. So he gets to reap all of the, the benefits. The $50 question for the day. What investor would ever sell you that contract? They have nothing to gain, right? Because if the market drops out, you're going to have to pay me. If the market goes up, I don't owe you anything. It's called the what? Premium or price. This is the price of the option. So in this particular case, where you're the producer, the feed yard operator, and I'm willing to sell you an options contract, and I think that there's a, not a, a high probability that fat cattle prices are going to drop below a 57. So what I would do is, is I will sell you this option contract for $3 a hundredweight. So in that particular case, what happens if the price drops to, to $55 a hundredweight? In that particular case, you get to exercise your contract so you can sell your cattle at $60 a hundredweight. Okay, you get 60 minus your $3, so your net is 57. So it's costly, isn't it? If you'd gone with the futures, you would have gotten $60. Now with the price moving against you with this option, you only get 57. You, you basically have paid me the $3. I paid you two. I take the biggest brunt of it as the speculator in that case. It's going to cost me $2, not five now, just two. Now what happens if the price goes up, let's say to 65? You're not going to exercise that contract, are you? You're going to sell your cattle for 65, but how much did you pay me? Three dollars, right? So what's your net? You got 65 minus the three dollars, so your net is 62. What happens if the fat prices go up to 70, however? You get 70 minus three, so you're going to get uh, 67. You see, you got an unlimited possibilities for gain. So the answer is why would you do it? is because you've got speculators or investors out there who are watching the market and think on the average they're going to make money by based on the price that they charge. Okay, other investments. We've already mentioned mutual funds. Basically, individuals put their money into these institutional investors. Uh, they pull the money and then they go out and they, and they buy stocks and bonds. And, and these can be very diversified or very uh, specialized uh, mutual funds. You may have the uh, S&P 500 or, or the Russell 5000, or you may just have stocks in the energy or stocks in the medical profession, or you know, there's, there's all sorts of variations of this that you can put your money into. You also have investment in real estate. You can buy rental properties, apartments. Uh, you can invest in office buildings, uh, other types of commercial property. You can also invest, uh, put your money in what's called the real estate in investment trust. They're called REITs, R-E-I-T, in real estate investment trust. And these big companies, these REITs, are ones that own a, a large percentage of all the large office buildings and apartment complexes and malls. And you think, well, I wish I could invest in uh, you know, downtown Dallas. Well, you can, okay, because you can buy stock in these REITs. In fact, over the last three, four years, REITs have outperformed the other blue chip stocks, but those are good to have in a diversified portfolio. You also can put your money in foreign stocks, and there's opportunities there. There's high risk as well, but it doesn't hurt also to have little bit of your diversified portfolio in, in Toyota or Sony. There's companies out there uh, internationally that might be good to have in your portfolio. We have to look at the uh, risk and return. We've talked about that. You know, the risk and return characteristics of an individual portfolio is going to depend on individual's risk return preferences. What I'm saying on that is, is every person has their own risk return preference. Some of you here are going to go out and just by your very nature are going to put your money in very high risk investments. 
with anticipation that there should be a high return associated with it. Others are always going to keep their money in government CDs or treasury bonds or things that are that may not have a high rate of return but, are, but you know are secure. And one strategy over the other isn't better than the other. It just depends on the individual and what they want to do.